The management of the Namibian Broadcasting Corporation appeared before the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Accounts earlier this week. The managers were asked to explain how they have implemented the recommendations from the findings by Auditor General Junius Ganjeke on the corporation's financial statements for the 2016-2017 financial year. The corporation has over the years been receiving disclaimer and adverse audit opinions from the external auditors. I have not been in a position to show cause as to what has been transpiring in terms of ever since we were here with you interrogating us. And sometimes what happens is that part of those activities sometimes do fall through the cracks. And it may not give a picture of movement that either will appear to be positive or negative in terms of where the organization is going. If the chair will allow, I'd like just to touch on one or two points in that regard. Yeah, what is quite important is to see that for the period under review, it's very important to note that the NBC managed to grow its annual own revenue to 20% from what it would have been in the previous year. It's very important that that be noted as well for the understanding of the committee. Being to that, we have seen a reduction of 24% coming from the shareholder. For OPEX, whereas for, for CAPEX, we've seen a 33% reduction overall in terms of what we do. And why this is important as the chair to the rest of the committee is, is that in order for this organization to function, it will always find it difficult because it's not a fully commercial business. And I'm stating this, if I'm not mistaken, it's either with the chair or Mr. Murora when we're asking at the time, how is your own revenue progressing? We just really want to go on record stating that these are some of the positives from our end that we've been trying to bring across because the MBT was making about 82 million and for this particular year, we went from, from about 82 to about 102 to about 102 million. We believe it's a positive that the committee must just take note of. And equally, for, that, for, for the time before the year under review, we had, about one we had about 21 issues that we needed to deal with that are coming from the time when we had disclaimers. And remember, Mr. Chair, one of the points that we had difficulty in explaining was from a disclaimer perspective, because at the time, there was nothing. Because everything was like, it was total chaos. And I think the, uh, I think the, the office of the Attorney General also knows we've been at pains. The Attorney General? Uh, sorry, the Auditor audit, audit General. We've been at pains in trying to put together a picture, especially coming from a year into another year, in understanding how accounting has been working. So we've been trying to do that, but at the time, at the point, there were 21 issues that were raised, which we had to clear. And coming to this financial year, our understanding at the time when we were dealing with the audit firm that was responsible, we had eight issues that would be coming to your office. But then midway, this changed to 10. We were not given an explanation as to why the issues went from eight to 10. We tried and sought for an, an explanation in that regard that we, we, we didn't get. So it's, it's, it's part of these issues that we find sometimes a bit difficult because entities that are responsible for this duty that will hold us to account, if they also don't talk to us when we can also put it forward it does create a problem. And if an opinion is changed without informing, it also creates a further, further problem because we were told in our audit and risk board meeting that the NBC would receive a qualified audit opinion. But that changed to an address. You were told by who? The entity that was appointed by the Office of the, of the Auditor General. You did not fall. You were written for. 
written form equally and also at the level of board subcommittee level. So that opinion also changed, we don't know. We tried also to seek for explanations, which up to now we couldn't get. This is just a few points, Mr. Chair, that I just wanted to put on, on record, so that at least our context in terms of where we are moving is understood within the framework of what we believe we are busy making progress in terms of where, where we are. Okay. You are working on the issues that have been raised in prior years. You are now at a point where you have addressed and attacked some of these issues. You acknowledge that there were 21 issues, management issues. You, you managed to address those issues to 8 or 10, depending on, on, on the number. But the point to still remain is that you, you still have an adverse opinion, and that is a concern to us as a committee. Let me also make another statement before I allow you to go to the, the question of the poll. There is an issue of I'm also very appreciative of the fact that you improve on your revenue side, you also improve on your cost side, you know, increasing revenue, reducing cost, and accounting for all these things. But to me, from a layman perspective, an adverse opinion is not really a, a, a revenue or a cost issue. The auditors are saying your, your financial statements that were prepared by yourself is not a true reflection of your financial position. That's what they are saying. <coughs> you put it in a language now and you can say you don't even account for some of the revenue that you are talking about. Or you don't even, not, not, not account, but has prudently account for it. That is why the opinion is still an adverse opinion. So, and, and, and it, it should also, as the Director General, I think it should also be a concern to you, if you keep on raising revenue, but the auditors are saying, but even notwithstanding the fact that you are raising your revenue and you are attacking your cost, you still cannot account properly for the financial position of the organization. And I think that, that is what, that is the point of departure from our perspective. So, so but I, I, those are pluses, you know, in, increasing revenue is a plus. But if you, for instance, in, in prior years we had a situation from the, from NPC where some of the revenue books the licenses of television could not be accounted for. That, that's a serious thing. Even if you increase your, your revenue on licensing now, but 200 licenses cannot be accounted for, that, that, that is still a concern. So I think we're moving from that perspective. Now, coming back to the question that I posed, uh, yes, I'm going to go. Let, let, me, let me just finish the question. That's before the question. Okay. My humble apologies, Jim. No problem. On the issue that was raised by the executive director of the audit opinion that was given by the company that was contracted, has this opinion been submitted to the auditor general office or could you please submit it now to the committee so that when we are going to discuss it then we have got evidence in, in writing as evidence. Thank you. Through the chair, yes, we, we will submit that. And again, Chair, we are taking away the points that you raised. The question of the uh, financial statements that were restated. Um, specifically referring to 2015-2016 financial year. My first question I would like to understand is what necessitated the restatement? 
of these financials? Uh, we take note of that one. We agree that it was an admission on our side. We've presented to our board on August uh, 2017, we've pro provided the annual financial statements. And we indicated to the board that we will restate uh, financial year 1516. And the board then requested, why do we restate? And unfortunately, because that was a significant item, post retirement uh, uh, medical obligation was a significant item. It amounts to 313 at that point in time. And it was also a ordered um, matter which was raised in the prior year. So what we did uh, is to conduct an actuarial review get the valuation, restate the figures. So when we had the discussion and present our financials, preliminary financials to the board, we indicated that as a result of that significant PR, PRMA uh, obligation that we need to raise, we need to restate the figures. However, I need to indicate that it was not deliberate that we have omitted to indicate to the, to the board that there were also few other restatements. Subsequently, uh, when the auditors pointed that out, we've provided them with the, with the board minutes, and in the board minutes it indicated that we are going to restate the figures, and also reason why we are restating. That was minuted, properly minuted. However, the minutes didn't reflect, you know, that we also requested for whole, you know, um, the various accounts uh, um, estimates that will be restated. So what we went, the auditors pointed that out, and we agreed with that. We had to go back to the board and we did went back to the board. We indicated except for the PRM, PRMA and the severance liability, we had to restate these figures and these are the reasons and board approved subsequently. So that matter was, was dealt with. So you, you, have, you have minutes yes. reflecting what you just said. Yes. Can you provide us with those minutes? external ones appointed and with the board as well. It's on the basis of that that we can show on minutes that it went through the, the process. Otherwise, I think even at board level, they would have taken issue if any explanation would not suffice. You have an internal audit function. Yes, outsource, of course, but still an internal audit function. But it looks like this, your systems of internal control are still lacking. That is what is leading to you know, this type of audit opinion. What is, what is the problem there? Yes, I also appreciate the fact that you did attack some of those issues. But, but we're still at, at a point where the auditors are simply saying that colleagues, you, you cannot account, you, you, your financials are not a true reflection of your financial position. With money that you pay into this internal audit, it's outsourced internal audit. What, what is the problem there? Is it just a, the, the cumulative effect of things that did not, that were not done properly? Or, or what is it? What is the problem? As I said, some of the difficulties is I'm going to use the word disclaimer again. I, and I will equate it to there's a wardrobe. When you open the door, things fall out. Many small, big, small parts, and you don't know where it is. As we were saying, I think, when we were here the last time, part of the difficulty that we had was to consolidate a process that was not there. And then in your current year, you run with things that need your attention now. And then at the same time, you still need to go back. And if the chairman will uh, remember, and for the members that were here as well, we had to go back as far as, I think, 2012, if I'm not mistaken. So maybe help me if I'm wrong there. These were part of the issues that we had to resolve. And part of the big, big problems that we had was when you close a financial year, you don't even know what you are carrying over, whether you are in any sense. Hence, I, I needed to make the comment at the beginning to indicate that despite the challenges that are there, there is significant movement that seeks to say that things are moving in the, in the right direction, Chairman. And this is why I also made an earlier point, but I take what the Chair has guided us on, 
in terms of where the discussion is now. Because in our view, it has been that we believe that things are moving in that, that direction by virtue of how we are narrowing the issues that are coming forward for, for discussion. And I don't know whether it would be appropriate at this point also to raise when we were also engaging with the external auditors, we requested them to give us a week, just one week, so that we could take care of the issues that they've raised before the final audit would come out, which is a normal process, because normally when audits are done, you get to the organization, you go through everything, give them time management now to provide whatever needs to be done, and if only they show that, management shows that they can provide you with then you close up. Unfortunately for us, we were not lucky because I think the office of, of the Auditor General did not grant us that week because there's one or two other points that are here that we raised that we believe that had we been granted that week's extension, there would not have been issues here because if I look again at the office of the Auditor General, we believe that we at least should have had about four or five issues only for reporting, and this would have been the ones, Mr. Chair, that are really like very substantial. And your question is also correct, because what we are raising here is almost like it's a standards issue that should have that should have been in place. But what I really would want to implore with, with the committee is just to appreciate where the organisation is coming from, coming so, from. So, so what you're saying? We see how things are improving. Maybe not as glossy as we would want, Mr. Chair. And I agree with you because this sometimes is the one-on-ones and things that should not have been there. But again, when we look at where we are going, we believe that we are slowly getting there. You, you mentioned that you, had you been given a week, you would have resolved the matter and perhaps changed the Two opinion. or three of them, yes. Now, now the question is, would you, would, you be, would you be able to put a date on you know, changing the whole situation to move out of this adverse opinion to either qualified or non-qualified opinion. We believe we are at the doorstep, Chair. So, can you commit yourself to a date? I don't have a choice, Chairman. I, I need to do that. Chairman. I need to do that. And we're hoping that the next audit mm -hmm. will hopefully give the picture that That's I That's what changed. you said the last time. Um, yes, in terms of progress, Chair. In terms of progress. I think the context is important here. The context is very important. It would be different, Chair, if one would have come into an organization that was sound, that was working the way it is. And I think I, I would be preaching to the converted if I would want to state as to what the situation of the NBC was. And I know Mr. Smith was also quite critical of many of the things that are touching on many aspects on how the business is running. And in particular, I think medical aid, pension. And I think we've had a discussion in that one as well. So for me, context is very important, but at the same time, it's to say, is there progress or are we regressing? I, I would have been worried, and I think I would be the first person to throw in the towel <coughs> and say that, sorry, this one is totally out of my league. Well, the exercise of determining the residue values, values of the fixed assets, and subsequently, recomputed depreciation. The adjustments were made to the books of accounts for depreciation, which was deemed to relate to the prior financial periods as following. <coughs> uh, the balance per the, uh, per the NBC, NBC's books were in total, and there were four uh, uh, accumulated depreciations, was 307 million. The balance <coughs> per financial statements was 344 million, and the adjustment was 37 million. So I would like to ask the, the Director General that he should explain to the committee what measures has the corporation put in place to ensure that similar non-adherence to the accounting standards are avoided or not uh, repeated in future. That we want committee to try and go around the book and say, because you just need to apply what standards are, and that's it. What we have done in this one, we, we had to engage, uh, we engaged ENY to help us at a technical level so that we can conform to the standards as they are. And as we speak now, that, that is in place. This is why I don't even want to waste the time there. It was an issue that was raised, 
linked to a standard of reporting, financially, accounting, which we have adhered to. And ENY was brought on board to assist us with that. And where we stand now, it's my understanding that we are in full compliance. I'll, I'll give over to the I'll give over to the CFO as well, just to give a short view on that one. Is that now? Yeah. Thank you, Director General. What we've also done is, since that matter was raised, we've also now um, have exercise in place where we produce on a monthly basis, we produce full financial statements, <coughs> reflecting your balance, your, your statement of your financial position, your conveyance of income, a full set of financial statements. And we are three um, uh, seniors in the department. We go through each item, we see whether we are complying in terms of, of the account, international accounting standard. That is one measure that we've implemented since then. Then we've also, uh, some of our colleagues also have enrolled and are completing the ACCA. It's also to assist us in the process of detecting compliance issues. Uh, thirdly, uh, like the DG said, the ENY is also for us uh, very uh, beneficial and add value for money. When we produce our financial statements, we also request them to go through through the annual financial financial statement and also detect maybe disclosure is, issues that they haven't uh, indicated. And you would mention that in the I, you would notice that in the prior year, uh, disclosure um, was a big issue. Now we've improved significantly on disclosure um, deficiencies. Uh, what we have also done, we are on undergoing training uh, our own people uh, attending accounting standards, uh, training um, conferences, and then we, will, we would like to, do, to assist us further. We, we were also thinking about asking the Office of the Auditor General to, in, to conduct interim audits that will also assist us, just to help us with, you know, with that specific and as a measure to improve on our compliance issues. Yes. And I think it was just an omission from all, um, omission from the people that process the depreciation calculations. And when we've detected that, when the auditors detected that as well, we've immediately justified it. The only difficulty here is the application of the, the international accounting standard, which, which says, Depreciation should be recognized prospectively. And the thing is, they've detected or we've detected the, the problem and we've recognized it retrospectively. So instead of prospectively, we've, we've recognized it retrospectively. So the standards but, but are. That is, that is why, in general, the fitness. Yeah, it's true. And I agree with you. And this is why I say it was a omission from our side. We do do, do um, accept that and also take note of that. And we are working on that. And I take it the internal audit also contract indicated with the internal auditors is that they, they should specifically also focus on compliance related matters, you know, and point that out to us. Sorry. Now to the point that has been raised by yourself, Mr. Smith and Mr. Moore. The, the, the lack of a sustained internal audit function is biting us. I think that's the message that is really, really just coming to Hence, I made the commitment to say that at this point we have to find its way towards the board so that that intervention is, 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 is done in such a way that we have a sustained process of doing that. The interim audit, Mr. Morora, was, in a way, it speaks to if we can have them, let's say, every quarter. And then as Mr. Smith has said, it will naturally just help you to see where you are going. Because it's almost like a matter of now, you are seated there, you wait almost until it's the end. And very importantly, the internal audit function currently has certain areas of responsibility that it looks at. It's also not a, even a fully fledged one that is there, because it's certain areas within the organization that we look out for. And it does come back to the point that the chair has raised is to say, what are these issues that are most probably holding back so that things are not happening? Some of them could be capacity internal as well, but again, Mr. Chair, as we were saying, we are busy systematically trying to phase out all the challenges. And I always say, 
the best way of looking at this, it's actually in the proof of the pudding. Today it's about 10 issues before it was 21. So that, in my view, Mr. Chair, in my own limited understanding, it has to show that there is movement that is moving. And I know that maybe from a committee perspective, the committee wants more. Yes, yeah, we'll be waiting for the yes, but, but at least to lead into a, a qualified, yes, a qualified yes. opinion. I fully agree, but in terms of, especially where I am as I the general, I, I can see that there is movement that is moving in, in that direction. But that's why I said that context of NBC linked to our engagement with yourselves as the, as the parliamentarians must be seen against where we are coming from as an organization. And I don't want to cast aspersions as to who was there, what they've done. What counts now is what we do now. Hence, I was saying much earlier on, we take it on the chin and we move forward with it. And hopefully, we are making that progress. Hence, also the request that we just put a few things into perspective as well. Okay. So that you have got a lack of an internal audit function within the corporation itself. But initially, you explained to this committee why you opt not to employ an internal audit, rather outsource it. So you have got reasons why you do it. So it, you should not put it as a lack of an internal audit to the committee, because you have reasons why you do not want to have it as part and parcel of the staff complement of the corporation. And therefore, while I am not as Honorable Gawana would have said from the accounting tribe, it is my <laughs> humble understanding that internal audit work should, or oh, before I get there, the Auditor General's office is indicating, I, I, I'm now not working directly with them, but when I was back there, we received a letter, let's say, three or two months before their arrival, that they would be coming. And in that period, we would be trying to see through our internal audit function that our big books must meet the requirements of the Auditor General's office. And that, to my understanding, is also what you are supposed to do. But in this case, you are, while you are having an internal audit function which you have outsourced, you want interim audits from the Auditor General's office, which means that you will over-employ the Auditor General's office by going back and forth. I don't know whether you would be paying for their travelings or whatever. Oh, no, luckily they are now in the window, but they, they, they will have to probably also employ other people to do the work because they have got other commitments too. And that is the, the, that is the predicament that I do not understand. The points that we've raised. The point around involving the Office of the Auditor General was mentioned as a means that we could get to in the event we can fix. The fact that we cannot employ currently, you do not just employ an, an internal auditor as a person, because that's an office on its own. And I said it as well, that due to the aspects linked to your cost liquidity, it's very difficult. Hence, even at the level of board, this matter was discussed, and a decision taken was to say, for the NBC not to have that function within it, the best would be to, to have that function outsourced. But when you outsource that, these people work against A rates. So you identify areas where you believe, and I think the chair will know, and Mr. Smith as well, and, and the, <coughs> the deputy from the Office of the um, <coughs> Auditor General, you will look at aspects that you believe are important to your business, and then on the basis of that, you engage. And <coughs> for us, at the back of the mind, is, it's also an affordability aspect. I hear what Ms. Murora is trying to say, but context again here is very critical for us. As opposed not to be having this function, we believe that at least we must do something. And I still am still strongly of the view. If we look at from where we are coming from, there is steady progress. Maybe not as amplified, as an enhanced as we would want it to be. But of course, we realize that the lack thereof within the organization 
is causing many of these problems because the internal audit normally will serve as a is your sounding board that will help you to take care of these things long before the external It will not be that that is fully outsourced and then they come to on the, on the funding of the shareholder, which is probably in a way correct, but I think before the funding takes place, there is a process which is referred to as a budget preparation. And in the budget preparation process, you make provision for the retired staff members' medical aid payments and all those kind of things. And before the funding is done, you also have to do budget motivation. When the allocation is being done, this money, you have to set aside because you can do anything in a corporation or company, but the recurrent budget is something that is also always to be there. It must be available at all times. That is one thing that you have to be sure of. You cannot, as the director general, go to work and at the end of the month, try to get your own salary, let alone those of the other people, your own salary from another institution. So therefore, I think the problem does not lie, in my opinion, with the funding. The problem must lie with the preparation and how the handling is being done after the allocation has been made. That is my understanding. I might be totally wrong, but an allocation is being done, but this allocation must secure at least the recurrent budget of all other things. Assets that are there that can mitigate, as rightfully pointed out. Now, what at the time also did not come through, nowhere was it recorded that at least on paper that it is there. And I think that was one of the biggest uh, issues that were also raised by the, by the auditors. Now, the, the exercise of, of recognizing that is done, it is there, it is on paper. But the reality around it, as you rightfully pointed out, Ms. Brown, becoming a point that can be, give comfort, it's that challenge that still remains. And that is a challenge that we are hoping that even parliamentarians as they sit here, when these things are brought to their platforms, should assist us with as well. Because if you're gonna be running an organization with the number of people that it is having, whereas funding from a shareholder perspective is dwindling, you will run into these problems. Because your own efforts of raising, of being able to raise and come up with revenue, linked to shareholder funding to make sure that your entity must be seen as an entity that is of good standing from a, from a, from a going concern perspective then you will not have these problems. For us, it's a matter of its liquidity, even from a balance sheet perspective, we are wounded as, as, as the NBC. The only improvement that we could bring on would be to recognize this on the books. But God forbid, where we are now, we can still manage retirement, post-retirements of people that are going through that. Where our challenge would be, would be if you would have 30, 50, 100 people going at once, then naturally this would hit you because the expendable resources that would have to be there, they would come to the fore and, and, and would haunt you. And I would also like maybe just to give to our CFO also just to put context, and if, I don't know whether it is a horizon one to as well, from an HR perspective as well, maybe just put in that area. Honorable uh, 
as indicated, their liability PR MI is 330 million, million dollars. So that figure was yeah, about million. Million. Yeah, yeah. million. Three hundred and thirty million. You made it to zeros. <laughs> <laughs> so this this is this is quite significant for us. Uh, we know we are obliged by accounting standard and by the Labor Act to give, give recognition to that liability in our records. And rightfully so, it was pointed out by the auditors. We started with that exercise, calculating, and the company has a, has a policy in place. And I think also the way the com company dealt with that one is to put a limit on that on that liability. Everything appointed after January 2015 will not qualify for that benefit. So the 313 million relates to people that was appointed before the. So the accounting standard requires you to recognize that liability in your books. And like the DG said, it's so significant for us. It's close to our our annual budget, we don't have the funds to set aside for that. But at least we know that we have a liability, you know, to take the fit. That is all that I can say. And, and this has been raised. Mm -hmm. Yes, he did not really answer the question as to what uh, is the plans to pay for the abilities in the resource okay. which I think as management we have responsibility to certainly have plans in place for any contingency which should it occur. Let it just be prudent if you could just explain the community as to exactly now you have any plans on 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 that has been communicated consistently, year in, year out, articulating exactly the concerns as, as raised there. Uh, remember to say the DG does not have a plan. The DG executes a business on behalf of someone. And whoever owns the business will not fully either capitalize or recapitalize it, then it will become an issue. What happens for us because a great deal of the business is through public funding. Whereas we also have our own elements where we, we generate own revenue. If, if that is not enough, where do you start and where do you begin? And this is part of the legacy issues that have been coming because this was, as far as we could tell, most probably never catered for. It is very important that that context is there because it was never there. and. Uh, we came on board, this were raised, and we are addressing that. As I said, one of the first things that we did was to recognize it on paper. But as to how it plays out in practice so that you can actually make that provision for, but this is where the troublesome area is now in reality. Because this is what I was saying. In the events that where you're gonna have more than 100 people now all of a sudden falling into that, where you have to now start doing something immediately, naturally you are exposed as, as a business. So this has been raised at the level of board, this has been raised at the level of shareholder through our line minister, they very, very much aware. But it's one of those legacy issues that are coming from a time that was there before I think many things have happened. And the liability is the liability when I like to The the fact that you have discussed this matter with the shareholder is also appreciated. But the fact that there's no response, a positive response, that's what I'm hearing, unless I'm making assumptions now, from the shareholder to address this issue, <coughs> this is even becoming more of a concern because this is a real liability. And perhaps it's also a question of once, now that you have revealed to us that you did have a discussion with the, the shareholder, what was the shareholder's response? Does the shareholder really understand 
the, the, the dilemma which you as, as an institution is facing if, if that, that is something that needs to be expected from the shareholder. Do, do they really understand? And, and perhaps I'm also asking directly the question of what was their response? What was the shareholder's response? I, I made two or three comments. One was to pick up what came out from the audit from a recognition perspective. I said that process is there. It's a paper exercise. And I went further, I said the reality is that looking at the numbers from a provision perspective, I did not brush it aside. I did say that that's where the bigger problem sits. And this is a matter, again, by the board that has been raised with the minister. And the minister, I'm aware that he's busy speaking to his counterpart at finance, and most probably to other offices where they also discuss. Because the moment it gets to the level of the minister, it becomes a political discussion altogether, for which, from a fiduciary perspective, I cannot get involved in. And I think, Chair, you will understand that much better than, than I am. But naturally, where, where the board is at this juncture, they are clear to state that the NBC appears not to be a going concern, exactly because of all these problems that are there. It's not a going concern. No, no, that's the view. That seeks to say that if you don't fix, we will find ourselves in a problem. Because up to now, both board and management have done their best they can to try and keep the business running. Hence, I was saying, even when budgets are put forward in Parliament, sometimes you don't find that people appreciate what you do. I don't know, maybe the NBC is not important. I, 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 I don't know. And the other day, two, three months back, I saw a similar discussion in South Africa, where all parties, irrespective of position, said that they believe that they, the public broadcaster is an important element within what happens. Now, I, I can only do as DG this much that I can, and I'm going to go back to the point that if the recapitalization or capitalization of the entity is not seen to be important, especially from a shareholder perspective, then it does spell disaster. But equally, this is a legacy issue. It's not like this thing came yesterday. Yeah. I, I'm not sure, Chair, whether I'm answering you, mm -hmm. because part of the redress sits now outside what we as a management are capable of, and myself as, as a director general. But what I can affirm is that the issue linked to all forms of funding that's, that, that should be becoming the NBC way is addressed at the level of the minister, because the board has been talking to say that the shareholder be aware these are the problems, this is what is happening. Honorable Smith was really on my case regarding medical aid pension and all of that, where myself and the chair of the board had to come and state a case. Mr. Romulora, we go through the budgetary provisions where we state exactly what the needs are, taking into account also the legacy issues that are there. You will know also, and it's, it's an open secret that PSUN is an issue. From time to time, medical aid and pension does become an issue. And, and these are the realities that we sit with. Hence, I think I appreciate the, the directive from the chair that we should be able to show the issues relating to the steps that have been taken, its dates, who has been spoken to, and this does include at our level and at the level of um, a level of board dovetailing into the office of the minister as well. Those efforts have been there. And unfortunately, what has not been forthcoming is the idea of saying, how do we resolve it? You will also remember this year, in May, when our minister was trying to motivate 
the NDC's budget, and I will quote him, he indicated that the amount given, which is 140 million, is not adequate. It will put the NDC as one of the entities that, that fall under him into troubles in terms of then moving forward to be able to do service and give everything that needs to be there. And, and this is a view that has been oncoming. As I'm saying again, me, I'm not running away. Running commercially, I've shown that there are things that we are doing that work. However, if there's someone who owns the business and they don't come and assist, and we are not a commercial entity. We are not like entities where you can make enough money that you would not need support from your shareholder, in this case, which is GRN. We will depend on that, unless if the model changes and it gives the NBC a full commercial platform, then maybe that, that, that might change it. But yes, we will be able to give the details indicating exactly what has been going through correspondence to the effect as well. We are a public entity, so I think the, 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 the committee here shows the right to those documents. Yes, in short, we've been raising this as an ongoing concern. Yes, three minutes. But what I'm not picking up is this liability was supposed to be supported by assets. It works exactly the same model uh, like uh, JPF. You put money there, JPF go and buy properties, invest and so on. Was there any time when this fund was supported by assets? If you probably if you go back a little bit, can you trace any assets which we are set aside specifically for this or it was just a zero problem game? Yeah, yeah, I hear what you are saying, sir, but again been auditing NBC for years. You know in and out, yeah, in and out. You know exactly what the challenges are. You're actually even better informed than I am who came late to the NBC in terms of where this is. Again, to state what I said, when this point was right, we indicated that because even recognition was not even put in black and white, we had to do steps that would give yourself, your office, comfort that we are in the process of addressing that. When one of those was to immediately recognize. I also said that when you look at NBC, balance sheet, a chair just now went through exactly what those challenges are. So it tells you what you are asking currently cannot be. Because as an entity, you have the challenges as real as they are. Is, is, is uh, the owner of NBC, and you will be given the mandate to run this institution on our behalf. We are at the point where we have to implement a structural change to NBC. Uh, I'm asking this question in view of, of the responder and some of the issues that are still coming, like get to clean up account. You know, if, and I'm asking you to do this because I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to come to the point, is NBC's foundation, the fundament, the foundation, is it, is it strong enough to build on? Do we need to break the foundation to build a solid house? That, that, I'm moving to that question, and, and, uh, and I think that is the job of, the job, I was a CEO, it's not an easy job. The job of the CEO is also to advise the owner, to say, colleagues, say, what are we doing? And I said it before to you, to say, I, I really appreciate the fact that NPC has got two legs. It's got a social responsibility leg, and it's got a commercial leg in my view. And I think there's a push and pull between these two legs. And I think the shareholder or the owner will have to carry the social responsibility leg fully and leave the commercial leg on its own. Hence my question to you. 
I think the DG will take on uh, the last question. But uh, let me say we are in a chicken and egg situation. It's good that uh, Honorable Uroa uh, have mentioned the budgetary process, which uh, the DG had also said it's uh, in place. The new budget, and at the end, two thirds of of uh, whatever you expect is gone. And now you get a 140, then a midterm review comes, like the year whatever back, and then you uh, 80 million is added. Now you probably set with uh, 210 uh, million. That process again next year starts. You get your 140, I don't know. From a 140, you get it at 80, it should be to a two, uh, 210. But uh, with a new financial year or financial year, you get a 140 again. Uh, it doesn't make sense, but uh, it's part of the challenges of which we are setting that uh, really from uh, uh, and uh, the DG have mentioned that uh, as far as our own revenue is concerned, there are signs that it's uh, moving. But uh, NBC is a public institution, and then uh, uh, it's not commercial. Hands of from a subsidy perspective, really it was hard hitting to just it to be reduced uh, with two thirds. I have listened to the uh, budget group discussions where, for example, uh, the chairperson, uh, uh, you may have also mentioned that in terms of the funding of NBC. It's, 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 it's an open secret in terms of that. So I think we are certain we should actually ask those questions that uh, we have put in our budgetary process. We came through a process and which is taken to power. What, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? The reasons are given the, the financial situation, the economic situation. But my brother is talking about plans. Plans in this case is cash, it's money, it's revenue, it's government subsidy, it's NBC's revenue. Without that, I don't know what plans are we asking. So we need to seriously reconsider. And it's good that you are mentioning that, and that's why I'm saying that you can address that. Is it a matter of breaking it and the ability? What is the way forward in terms of that? Um, I'm not coming to the point. I think the question just very simple is that the plans could have no plans. So if there are no plans, then you just say that there are no plans, then it's just the normal. Thank you, sir. I don't know. I said plans is related to government subsidy and NPC's revenue. What plans are you making if you don't have even that from a subsidy perspective? So that's all that I'm saying. That as an auditor, I believe the Deputy Audit is in a better position to understand that the issue of budget is cut with two thirds. And, 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 and that is the situation. Uh, you should be in a better position to, to understand this. Yes, I just want to When I said that there are two thirds of the revenue or whatever resources are gone, it's a matter of you have your operational cost, you have your capex, and that the moment that amount reduce, you will struggle to pay your medical, you will struggle to pay your pension and so on. Let me make it clear in terms of, say all of you are getting a 10,000 or a 30,000, that's what you get as a salary. You have your expenses at your house, whatever you need to do. Next month, we are saying now, you are not gonna get a 30,000 anymore. You are gonna get a 10,000. So it's true that probably you need to readjust. But it's a matter of if you are readjusting, where should you readjust? What is the point? Because you cannot afford probably to pay all. So that misunderstanding or 
the misconception that uh, and it comes into the other point. That's why I wanted to hire you to hold it until the accounts paid. Because your moment your income is reduced, or in this case, payslip or a deduction doesn't mean money. It doesn't mean you did hold money somewhere or we did that cash. No. It's a matter of a payroll process. But at the end, if you have to pay out, you need to go to a bank account in order to make payments. So that's why I'm surprised that auditors and treasurers cannot understand a, a, a simple payroll process where you, at the end, need to go to a bank account in order to make payments. So that fallacy and misconception that we did have money from people and not paying over, that's not true. Because it's a payroll process, but at the end you need to go to account in order to make your payments. So that is as simple as that. A training accountant should even be able to understand that if you have same problem. And that deduction, you have created another vehicle in which that deduction is to be deposited. Mm -hmm. And that is the pension fund and uh, whatever. Are you telling us that that amount that you deduct from her salary is just an accounting entry? Is it not money that is, first of all, entitled, she's entitled to? Secondly, you deduct it on her behalf to make sure that the moment she falls sick, she has got medical aid to go to a doctor and to get assisted. Mm -hmm. You say that you from NBC, I just want to hear you. Mm -hmm. And I want you to, to drop your, your timbre out. Yeah. Are you saying that that is just an accounting entry? Mm -hmm. Can you just explain that? All that I'm saying is basic salary, medical, pension, whatever. So this is your peninsula with all these elements which you at the end needs to pay out. This is your bank or your cash, government subsidy, own no, revenue. No, no, don't go there. No, no, let no, me no, explain. No, don't go there. Let Just me explain. explain this simple thing. Because yeah. you know, I, I want you to explain this simple matter. Yeah. When you say basic salary, Karoi yeah. here, Upi, yeah. do you pay that basic salary over to her? Chairperson, allow me to explain. After I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to. I just want to because because yeah. I mean, no, what you do the moment, the moment okay. you the moment you tell me some yeah. of these complicated issues you already said, no, no. I might not understand it. Yeah. We now, have, now let me see the value of your package is thirty, and all these elements, basic whatever, needs to add up to to thirty. Now there should be cash. If I need to pay over. The, the next salary, for example, to your, into your bank, there should be physically cash of that value in the account, in order, in, in the NBC's account, in order to pay over this next salary. Yes. Okay. The other elements with the deduction, the, 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 the processing of payment, a pension of uh, 500 needs to be paid over. Yes. Now, if there is no money in that account, then you will fall in arrears with your pension until you have the resources in order to pay over. Medical the same. If you have to pay over, there should be cash or a money in the account in order for you to pay over. What the deductions on a payslip doesn't mean we did a cash from someone and paid it over someone. It's a matter of that is the process, then, but you need to have what, that's what an account. Saying, that's all that I'm saying. That's what you're saying is simple to understand. Mm -hmm. It's not simple. Mm -hmm. because, because you have the, that employee of yours, mm -hmm. you have a condition of employment. Mm -hmm. She has accepted those conditions of employment. The fact that you are saying, basically what you're saying is that I don't have money to pay my statutory obligation. That's all you're saying. Nothing more than that. You're saying that I don't have money to pay <coughs> statutory obligation. 
but you are you are obliged to pay. If you, if you, and and that, that is why I asked the, 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 the DG the question. If you are in that situation where you cannot even make good of your statutory responsibility, do you think that you are technically solvent? No, you're not. And if you're not technically solvent, you cannot just lay back and say, everything is fine, because everything is not fine. So it's not as simple as you put it, because you seem to be saying, as long as I don't have money, I can just lay back and say, you people must understand that I don't have money. That is not a, a prudent way of managing an institution. That's what I'm saying. I'm explaining a process which were sound in the payments and so on, but the DG can take over. But I was explaining a process as a, a payroll process, how it works. That's all that was what I, I was explaining. Yeah, can I understand you? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Mr. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, I think I need to come in because yes. we, are, we are missing some points here. Sure. I'll try, Mr. Smith, Mr. Moroa, and also the officer of the to try and just illustrate what this thing in reality means. Ordinarily, the NDC gets 20 million as a subsidy from the shareholder, which is double. And then the NBC contributes anything between 9 and 12 million on its own revenue money. Now that works out more or less either depending on what you need to expend in the region of 29 to 32 million that you need to spend per month. That's now all things being equal. And this does not even relate to aspects of cost. I guess that's legacy that needed to be taken, payments that needed to be taken care of. Now what happens, the 20 million now gets cut with 8.4 million per, per, per month. You now sit with that reality where for every month you have less, about 8.4 million. That's quite a sizable amount, Mr. Chair. It's not 200,000, it's not 800,000, it's 8.4 million. Extended to that, you get, you are in a country where the economy starts behaving in a way where it's going down. Where, where the institution would be able to make between 9 and 12 million, as I have said, all of a sudden that also now takes a dip to about maybe 6, 7 million. This is the trend that has been coming now for the past 40 years or so where from a, from a subsidy perspective, the subsidy amount that came our way took the dime. What it typically does, and it most probably will answer some of the questions, it means then, instead of you now having about close to 32, 30, 29 million per month that you must do your business now, you now less, you have less than 20 million that you must still do business with. And this is where the short payments are coming through. But linked to that, Mr. Chair, and to the rest of the committee, you still pursue the issue of raising this with the shareholder. And that's linked to the documents, I think, that just went through, because part of that was to say, can you substantiate that these discussions, discussions are on there? Now, when these things get reported in, in media, the impression that comes through is that NBC is optimally funded, but they're not paying over some elements of payments that needs to go through, like the statutory things. And I think Mr. Smith is well versed with this one, which is your medical pension, and uh, I think payers will pay as well. It's that deficit of an 8.4, you can calculate it over 12 months. It's a sizable amount that you no longer have. The market responds differently. It does become a problem. And linked to that as well, back to the question around assets, you have where the balance sheet does not speak properly, you have these amounts that are there, that are big, that needs to be provisioned for, and, and you can't. But it's not that you're just sitting and doing nothing. That's not the case. These things are being raised, but as a management on the day, you try and do the best that you can to try and salvage the situation so that, first of all, you take care of employees. Secondly, 
you also take care of creditors. And whilst you're doing that, you raise the issues, the level of bond, board chair and the whole substantive board raise the issues with the line minister. And hopefully these discussions are coming through there. So these are the realities when we look at the paper exercise that Mr. Karaisa was trying to explain. Because you sit with, with that reality where yesterday you could provision for everybody. But today you have less of a subsidy. All of a sudden you don't have enough of that money. And what I agree with Mr. Smith is to say that if you are given money, it's prudent that you live within the means of what you have. But problem comes in when that gets cut now. And yesterday it was different. How do you deal with that? You engage and you discuss up to a point where a firm position might be taken. A position that would, that would seek to say, maybe we can't do this or we don't want to do that. On the point that the Chair has raised on the um, issue of the social responsibility, linked to the commercial part, I think I'll just wait until he's here so that I can just respond to that. But the aspect of deductions that are made, and yet you don't have the cash somewhere in the bank, must be seen against. I tried to give a very simplistic explanation. You have per month 20 million government subsidy, you bring in between 9 and 12, all of a sudden there's a cut of 8.4. It naturally means that your operations will not function the way that they would have, because all of a sudden you don't have that cash. And these are set costs. It's not that they vary, because they are set, these are things that you need to pay. The people are there, everything is there. So that is what makes that problem, that, that makes that issue problematic. If we don't go then to our government via our line minister, where the midterm budget review is being discussed and we get additional money, it means that in that financial year, Mr. Smith, you have that problem, as it would have been like the time when you raised it, I think it was 2015, 2016, where you raised it. And part of that was mitigated through the process where the midterm budget process would come, either with an 80 or 100 million, and then you can even out. But then you start the new year, you regress again back to where the problem is. Mr. Chair, on the issue of social, the social responsibility, and the commercialization of the business, it's a very, very good point that you raise, and I'm glad that it's coming from you. Because what it does is it speaks to your mandate. If your mandate is that you must bring affordable uh, communication, affordable information to people, where you will not necessarily charge people for these services. Remember, we don't work in a setup where we say, Mr. Mororo must pay a thousand bucks per month. We get subsidized to do exactly the same because whatever he needs to pay to NBC, whatever we get from a commercial perspective, we are confined within what that mandate says. Now, if the element of the social responsibility is not properly funded, for which the NBC stands for 100%, then we will have the problem of not being where you are having these challenges let alone the issues that are coming from a legacy perspective. And I was just making the example of saying that ordinarily we get 20 million from government per month. We contribute anything between 9 and 12 million, could be more, depending on what the commercial market is. Now, if that subsidy of 20 gets cut with 8.4 million, you all of a sudden now have a situation of 11.6 million that you must deal with today. And yesterday was different. That's the dilemma that comes in. And I think this is the point that Mr. Karaiza was trying to explain, to say that when you do your, your numbers, on paper, for instance, it will show exactly this is what it is. And what we do, Mr. Chair and the rest of the committee, like with your NAMFISA and them for pension, PSU, and we engage and we discuss and we say we currently have this challenge. Is there a way in which you can give us a little bit of, you not know, put too much pressure, and then we try and raise money. Next month you pay two installments, and then the other one you pay, and, and then it becomes that vicious cycle where you don't know what you need to do. Hence, I, I like the question that you put to say that, is that Monday social responsibility? Because it has to be funded somewhere. It's like hospitals. When people go to public hospitals, they more or less get the same type of treatment. The medicine is subsidized because government will pay 
full commercial pricing for that. But when it gets to people, it's at the subsidized level. The same applies to NEC. If you want to do the social responsibility in terms of the work that needs to be done from an information developmental aspect, someone who needs to pay for that, we can account for the aspect of the commercial value. And we have shown that it's slowly growing. But where we are today, we are dealing with the issues just management, counting, and, and all of that. But you cannot look at these things in isolation. Because at the point they converge, they become an issue. They become part of what we need to be looking at as, as an yeah. entity. That's the bottom line. Mm. Secondly, when I, I come here and apply for a job, I would care less, my friend, whether you have money in the bank or not. If you sign a, a contractual obligation with me, that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the document, and that is a contract. Mm of employment between you and me. That is why laws are there. That is why companies under normal circumstances are being prevented from trading under these conditions. If you say, what can I do? There's no money in the bank. That's why companies said the company law is actually preventing you from trading, because mm -hmm. you cannot, you cannot yes. fulfill your obligations. <clears throat> but yes, we are dealing with a state-owned enterprise, where the state will have to, and, and, and I'm saying this also for, for us as members of, of parliament, and the, the state will have to come in and, and basically declare themselves about the situation moving forward. But myself as a, as a public account, and somebody to protect, I've, I've said it some time back. And I said it in one, if the person who, who confronted me on that statement was the minister of finance. I was saying that I don't understand why government is throwing money into a bottomless pit. It's better for you to close the pit first before you throw in the money. I'm actually at the point, and I, and I think that I'm, I'm going to interrogate that question even further, maybe not on, under this platform, but at another stage. Where, mm -hmm. That is the question also to be answered by the owner. The owner will have to call the short in determining the way forward. Because currently, nobody is saying that the economy is going to improve. Mm -hmm. Nobody is saying that the, the financial, some of these issues will be, will be things that will happen in, in the shortest possible time. If the employees start demanding what is rightfully theirs, my friend, it will not be as easy as what you are saying. It's easy for everybody to understand. But I'll bring my contract and say, my friend, this money that you were supposed to have deducted was supposed to be deposited there. But you are simply saying that I must understand that because of the fact that you don't have money, it's not there. It's not that easy. It will put you in a dilemma. And we want to help you to get out of the dilemma. And one way of helping you, and I, 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 even though you had an adverse opinion last year, I was one of those people who try to also assist you to have an increased budget. But with it, without a proper definition of who is NPC, what is their fiduciary responsibility, what is their mandate? And because the moment you say it's social responsibility, then you have to live fully with that definition of yours. And then I think that is why we're getting into So, but the question that has been posed, and I think the conclusion that we draw is that there's no provision, there's no asset covering for that particular contingent liability. There's nothing. I think, I think, DJ, uh, AG, mm -hmm. that, is, that is basically the, the mm -hmm. answer that we're getting from the colleagues. Uh, 
before we, before we proceed to the next item. I wanted to make a statement. Thank you very much. I, I know we are running a little bit late in time, but uh, I think my understanding is that the element of social responsibility is an element that is the responsibility, the full responsibility for that matter, of the shareholder. And the shareholder has employed people to implement this responsibility. And it is therefore, to my understanding, that I have said that you must be in a position to motivate the budget that the shareholder, if it wants its social responsibility to be fulfilled, must meet these requirements. That is your responsibility. Operation for NBC. Let's say, let me give you an I'm just giving an example. I'm, I want to say a comment by example. The government per month will allocate a budget I mean, per year, allocated a budget of 140 million, which is divided per month, which is 11.6 million every month that you are receiving from the government. NPC operation are in the range of uh, 35 million. If you deduct per month, per month if you deduct 11.6 million from 35 million, you have got about, uh, let me say, 20 million. The money, the actual money that you receive, it is 11. Now, you have got people that are here, and those ones that we left behind, that we need to take care of as management. The first thing that we need to consider, first and foremost, is the net salary of those employees. The second thing that we need to consider is the housing for those employees. Then that 11.6 million is finished. Now, we asked, we wrote, the last submission that I gave to Mr. the chairperson is the effort that management have tried and tried and tried and become a norm for us to write several correspondence and correspondence and correspondence to our line ministry, through our board, engage our board members. Issues are well known, even in parliament. And we don't have that funds to pay for the difference. It is not like the money was there and it is misappropriated. I think Mr. Mururo, you understand now that the money was never there and it was never mis misappropriated. And I think I've answered your question. Just simple way. <laughs> because, Good question. Because, because the bottom line, I, I'm, I'm also, I also have a budget. Everybody, every one of us has got a budget. We all try to live within our budget. And that's why I'm saying that this is why I'm facing that, that question of structural adjustment. There must be something to structurally adjust NBC. Maybe you must, you must, you must resign as soon as possible so that, because, because the things that you took out, yes, they are fine. But the things that you did not pay are also statutory yeah. to the person that, that you have signed an agreement with. Oh, we have full appreciation of the fact that the money that you're getting from government is not enough. But to continue doing the very same thing, hoping that manna will fall from heaven, is not a prudent, prudent way of managing the financial matters. That is why something else needs to be done. I have full appreciation of the letter that you sent to the, the shareholder, which is the right thing to do. But if the response of the shareholder is not positive, it is still incumbent upon management to say, colleagues, under these circumstances, closing shop is not an option because we are a state-owned enterprise. 
maybe let us propose, let us propose a structural adjustment, structural change to the whole organization. Even if you have to move the institution from social to commercial, so that the 11 million can fit the, commercial, the social part and the rest become commercial. You know, but, but I, I'm not thinking that just, you know, as an example. But just doing this is not the right thing to do. You see, we management the board. The shareholder owns the business. So the fiduciary duty around their own responsibility is something that cannot be ignored. And I'm, in the, I'm in imploring that the same committee take that up at that level as well. Because in order for us to make sure that this entity is an entity that must be a going concern, it must be dealt with at that level. I also take issue if budget, and I, I was trying to make a very practical example of just saying 32 million, 20 from, from, from the shareholder, all of a sudden it's 11.6. Where does that leave you? You immediately see with a shortfall of 8.6. That's the reality, and we can also not go away from that. Naturally, we own up for the things that we are responsible for that are within the powers that we have. But when it gets to optimally funding, it sits somewhere else. That's why the documentation that came through will show beyond reasonable doubts that, at least from a management board perspective, a lot has been done to try and address the issue. So. Whoever is responsible for the funding from a shareholder perspective, they can also not just sit there on the side and pretend that things are not. Because there's also their element that comes through that does become a problem, that naturally does affect whatever we, we may need to do. So it, it, it is not just as simple as saying that, yes, as a management, this is where it is. I understand that from, from, from an auditing perspective, that provisioning is not there. And it's a legacy issue. There are many legacy issues that are linked to the NBC, especially from a funding perspective. And I agree with the chairman to say that it might be time that we really look at what this model should be for this entity so that the right uh, framework can be put into place that hopefully will, will, will take us out of this. Because I didn't resign to come here all of a sudden to be a bad person. And I need to put it on record as well. I've stated in the opening there's a lot of positive, positive things that we've done. We cannot all of a sudden, all of us be bad in terms of where we want to steer the organization. I, I, I will not agree with that. Because there's a lot of good things that are coming through for which the chair has also said we are seeing that. But the legacy part of the organization, in as much as we may not want to talk around it, we cannot just simply ignore it. It is simply not there because it's a fact that is there and we're very much aware. But in terms of where the economy is as for the whole of the country, we are in sync with it. But as to what call needs to be taken, as to what needs to happen to NBC, that unfortunately sits outside our area of, of, of power in relation to a decision that must be taken. And in fact, that's a decision that is vested with the minister. Because article, I think, uh, I think um, Section 29 of the NBC Act is clear, is that if issues of this nature are there, the minister must make the call as to what should be happening. So it, it, it's very important. So the aspect of also just saying that the money is taken, it's not used for that. If it's not put into, call, into context, it will give the wrong impression. And this is something that I believe I cannot allow to go through without giving an explanation. It's not about justifying. It's about stating what is fact, which is on black and white.